This is O'Reilly Media, and we're here at Oracle's Open World. We're sitting down with Savoir Tech. They're based in Colorado. Could you guys introduce yourselves? Yes, uh, I'm Jeff Ganender. Joanne Edstrom. And what exactly do you do? We do a lot of consult open source consulting on uh, service-oriented architecture. So our prime technologies we work with are Apache Camel, Service Mix, CXF, and ActiveMQ. Okay, there's a lot. There's been a lot of open source innovation in the last few years. There's projects like Service Mix and Camel and all these things. But I don't know if people really know what they're all about. Could you go through each of those projects and tell us exactly what they do? Sure, I'll let, I'll let Johan do that. Uh, I'd start with the oldest one, that's CXF, which is really web services, uh, kind of the foundation, the basis for what became SOA. Uh, that combined with ActiveMQ gives you message-driven architecture. You combine those two and you say that you want to add some routing to it, you want to add transformation, you want to add transactions, you want to add rules, you got Camel coming into the mix. You take all of these ones together, you bun bundle it as a product, you have service mix. You have a fully fledged SO architecture, ESB, bus, if you want to use all the bus words. What I like to say is that you're really using it to develop message driven applications. So you can almost deliver your applications as if you were a swing developer and you're using the uh, EDT. And you think about your applications in that way. They become message driven, they become asynchronous, they become fast. And that's how you can scale these applications, which is why they're interesting to uh, the big enterprise. In terms of the buzzwords like e um, ESB and message driven architectures, it's much easier to think about this when you can think about a specific example. Is there a specific application that shows what all these projects can do together? I think the, the absolute simplest one would be the hardest. That's a HTTP-based be request response. It's by definition, it's a synchronous service. But if you use these techniques, you take the servlet request, you cut it up, you make it asynchronous, you pull it out over, say, JMS, you have competing consumers, you get the response back, you have an asynchronous, synchronous service, suddenly you can scale that servlet container across the cloud, across multiple data centers, across continents, it's still the same web service. Okay, so that actually makes it more concrete. There was an example, I forget where, but it was an example of someone creating a web request and response system which was asynchronous, and I think they used Redis as a sort of middle point to mm -hmm. store these objects. Um, talk to me about what is the alternative? What, how are people working now in terms of the request re re response loop? Well, you can use uh, Camel. You can use that combined with ActiveMQ. You could use Camel combined with Scala and Actors. You could use Camel combined with Akka. You could use Camel combined with Mina. It's really down to how you want to design your application, what your constraints are, what you want to run in, say, the same JVM, where you want to cut things off, where you want to have a point of delivery. Uh, and a lot of the things in SOA, so to say, the buzzwords, they're really just good engineering to me. You have points of delineation, demarcation, kind of the same way you would build a network. You say you have stages of where you want to propagate data, and then you want to aggregate data back to get a request cycle. And I'll, uh, I'll add on to that. Uh, the nice thing about Camel is it has so many different types of endpoints to be able to do request response. You know this is tied to HTTP or a web service utilizing HTTP. You can speak to it with JMS through SMTP, you know, through, through mail, through Jabber. Uh, I think today Camel comes with over 105 different endpoints to be able to utilize for push and pull, both for producing and consuming. And that's what makes it so sexy, is that it can talk to just about anything. And it's just all about as simple as wiring it together with very little code. For example, if you want to talk JMS to the outside world, you write one line of Java code or one line of XML and you're done. All of a sudden, you don't have all this plumbing. The plumbing, the plumbing is all done for you. And with all these endpoints, it's all done for you. So when people think about message-driven architectures, I think one of the issues is that they're thinking about these corporate systems. So let's say you're at a big corporation. You have a number of departments. They have a 
billing department and an inventory department. You might have another web application. You know, those words aren't very exciting to think about. And then you have an enterprise service bus, and then these applications interact with each other in an asynchronous manner. But what I hear you saying is that you can turn things that aren't traditionally thought about as queues into queues. So you can put a queue into your web request response cycle. One of the things that people are going to say is, well, what about latency? Doesn't that sort of add in latency into something where you're trying to minimize latency as much as possible? You can get latency. You, you, you're always going to have latency with asynchronicity because you're queued up to a certain degree. So you will have some latency, but you also have to kind of put that into perspective. Do you need microsecond turnaround times um, or is a few milliseconds okay? It, that really, you, you kind of go into the different realm of how do you architect the system. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're using a standard web service or you're going to do an entire um, workflow. If you architect it right, you can get a lot of low latency out of it. And there's ways of getting around the latency. Do you really want to have go to JMS for your message driven or a set of the way to go? In other words, can you do it? Can you queue it up in threads within the system? So there's lots of ways. There's something called straight through that you can go directly through your different transformations and then come back. Um, so you can get the latency out of it if you want. But definitely the more asynchronous you have, you will have some latency. Okay, I'm sort of latching onto this idea of putting in asynchronous queues and buffers into the web request mm -hmm. uh, because you look at a place like Twitter and Twitter has to scale massively and I think a lot of their front end is still in Ruby on Rails. Mm -hmm. It sort of brings up the question, if you wanted to put some of this into the web request cycle, the application stacks, the application frameworks like Rails, those aren't developed to support asynchronous queues and buffers in the request cycle. Things like the Java servlet spec, they need a request object. Mm -hmm. They often rely on having direct access to, you know, often persistent connections to the browsers. So I guess the one thing that I'm sort of focusing on is putting asynchronous interactions into parts of the application that people aren't thinking about. Um, you know, what, what does it take to move to a model like this? Well, you can do that. With Camel, for example, it supports many different types of languages. You, it supports Scala. There's JRuby. You can do Ruby scripting. Okay. Um, there, there, it, it supports all different types of scripting languages. It can call out um, to uh, execute things at the operating system level if you wanted to. In order to communicate with Camel, Ruby and Rails absolutely could do it through Stomp. Uh, which is a protocol to be able to go directly into JMS, so you're giving it asynchronicity right out of the box. Uh, Twitter, my understanding is they wrote their own whole messaging system behind the scenes using Scala. Um, so they, they do have that, you know, that bridge of Ruby and you know, a JVM type of technology to be able to do asynchronicity. Well, and I mean, uh, look at ActiveMQ. You could use uh, REST, you could use WebSockets. Look at Apache Apollo. You can use the new Stomp over WebSockets. You get tons of integration possibilities. You can easily integrate Perl, PHP, Ruby, JavaScript. You could do it inside of a web page. You can do it in the container. Uh, if you're in a servlet container, sure, it's much easier. You could do it reference-based, so to say, uh, pass by value in, inside of the same container. Um, there's so many ways, but you can see it in a different way as well as saying that uh, what's the difference with soft updates in a file system? You have a log file, you have some sort of semaphore, you contain the events. And that's really what this type of architecture is for me, is that you control uh, and buffer things, you get them down to disk, you get them down into memory, you manage the sessions you've had in Jetty, you have had continuations for a long time. I believe the same continuations are in Tomcat. That gives you the hold the thread, continue the thread, keep on running. But the biggest benefit, if I just can go back to that latency question is, yes, there's latency, but you trade that against, say, you have an extremely costly process that you can spread out across so many systems, which means that instead of having to write something in Comet that waits for a request reply, you can pre load calculations. You could do a calculation matrix where you say that I'm calculating these numbers ahead of time, pick them up from whatever number generator. You could uh, take image generation, scale it down to a matrix, get pieces of the image, put it together from different systems. 
So it ties back to the whole that you could deploy on demand, you can scale on demand, you could have a spike in your business traffic where you say, we have thousands of credit card processing events. Well, yes, I have more nodes. Do it on the fly. And that, that's where this stuff is fun. Okay, so that seems to be the direction that we're moving in. Yes. Right. Everything is going to be asynchronous uh, in terms of scalability, just put more nodes into the system. But at the same time, the simplest systems out there, the simplest apps, some of the um, languages that people are using now aren't really focused on that. So mm -hmm. let's say I'm using something like Ruby on Rails, which is a, you know, a very popular uh, framework. You say I, I can use Stop to interact Certainly, with, yes. Um, with, with Apache Camel. Um, how do I get started? How do I drop that into my network? Uh, if you take ActiveMQ and you want to start with something like that, it's no more difficult than installing Tomcat. It's basically unzip a tarball, fire it up, start running. Uh, it violates the JMS spec in that it allows you to create queues. So to get started developing, it's fantastic because everything is basically done dynamically for you. Uh, go look on the page where it says languages, download whatever applicable uh, language structures you want to have, and you could have your Perl applications, your Ruby applications, they can all talk to each other. And the cool part is when you go out, you talk to somebody at a company, and they start saying, well, we have a mainframe application, we have a Perl application, we have reporting, uh, we have some Oracle stuff that we pull into a database. Well, that can all be integrated. So one of the previous interviewees, did, uh, David Blevins, talked about how the secret to the modern enterprise is to get smaller. Many pieces, much smaller. Uh, also to allow people to choose which languages they want to use. It sounds like this is the kind of technology that will let people experiment with a Ruby on Rails app, experiment with a Clojure app, but then also c keep their existing investments in some you know, big, scary, legacy system. That's exactly correct. That's the nice thing about Apache Camel. It's so small and so lightweight that you can piece together the components that you want, utilize and leverage the, the components that you want, and have any type of application outside of it be able to work with it directly. And that was the whole idea was to keep it extremely lightweight. So it makes it very user friendly for anyone in any language to be able to integrate with. And at the same time, leverage, you know, we hate to say it, the enterprise buzzwords, leverage a broker, leverage the ESB. You're basically building a poor man's ESB. But if you start with that kind of an architecture, utilizing something like a camel, then those who are doing the simple stuff today, it will grow and won't have to be rewritten down the road. And that's a very important concept, especially with cloud. That seems to be the theme of the last year or so. You've got Twitter, you've got Square, everybody's yes. moving. Everybody, it seems like we all abandoned enterprise Java. We're all coming back to it. Yes, well, there's, I don't think we, I think what we abandoned was the monolithic application server. And I'm, I'm currently on uh, the EE7 spec group, uh, and was on EE6, and that's a big discussion point is the whole modularity component, being able to pick and choose. People want that, and definitely the day of the you know, the one gigabyte, you know, download, huge memory sucking application server is long over. How many people really use an app server and the entire, the entire engine for, for everything they use? I think I asked that at one of my talks and I don't think I saw a single hand raised. People use different components. They'll use a web component. They might use an EJB or they might use JPA or something to be able to talk to a database. The, the beautiful thing about Camel is you pick and choose, you put it together, but you've also got this bus and you've got messaging and you've got routing, which is becoming the basic component of an infrastructure. And I hate to marry enterprise with that, but you get the enterprise capabilities with what Camel offers pretty much for free and it's extremely lightweight. This is my last question. You told me about a client that I'm particularly interested in because I'm absolutely afraid of flying. So you say that you're working with the FAA at this point? That's correct. So, so what are you doing for them? Let me let Johan talk about it. Oh, wow. Uh, what we did was the, uh, it's called WCSRI. It's the Weather 4D Data Cube. It's a reference implementation for the FAA where you basically say, I want to have the weather data two kilometers out, 20,000 feet up. Uh, around O'Hare. I want to have it in five minute o intervals and I want to have it sent all the time. And that will go out to, I think there are 469 public uh, airports in the US that are operated by the FAA. 
plus a number of undisclosed that get more data. And all of this is built around ActiveMQ, it's built around CAMEL, it's built around CXF services. Uh, we integrated all of their legacy services. We're integrating with computational clusters, hence the asynchronous web services, to pick up this type of imagery. And that's what's sent to control towers so that they can guide us through space. So that's a, that's a massive deployment. We're part of a small, small, we're, we're a small part of a huge deployment. Mm -hmm. But it, it's going to be, what's the ERAM2, it has had some uh, less favorable press due to uh, missed deadlines and so on. But compared to the 1960s technology that's there in place today, this, this is a pretty brilliant solution. And it's amazing what we did, we, what we utilized with CAMEL and ActiveMQ is be able to push around two gigabyte payloads of geospatial data at any given moment. And you have to think outside the box to be able to do that. You obviously can't be sticking two gigabytes of memory into an MQ. Um, you you got to kind of think about sending the metadata along and, and file pointers. And you got to think a little bit outside the box on how it goes. But uh, the federal government, FAA in particular, has bitten off very big on open source and CAMEL in particular and ActiveMQ. So you mentioned that this thing that you're building for them is also open source? It is open source, yes. It's actually MIT licensed. Uh, it's um, under the MIT's, I, I, it can be Googled out there and for access to their subversion repository and you can actually look how, how everything was built and everything works together. It's licensed under MIT, mm -hmm. but are you taking some of that and putting it back into the Apache project? We have. We just, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we put a couple of patches back into the Apache project, and they've actually said we would be very much interested in being showcased for solutions. Absolutely. One more weird, weird sort of esoteric question. Mm -hmm. The federal government isn't allowed to make copyright assignments, so how, how, how did you work around the, 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 the open source? Um, everything that we're doing is done through MIT uh, as one of the subcontractors, I guess, of the United States government. Okay. So uh, they kind of handle all of the, I, I guess the contract was handed directly through MIT and then all subsidiaries and it, the rule was it was to be MIT licensed. So, so officially MIT is, is, is the actual organization that's donating it to the Apache. Foundation. Yeah, I guess it's, it's MIT UCAR RAL, which is the research branches where the government works with MIT. Okay, all right. Well, you know what? This is all <laughs> very deep in the weeds, but it sounds like you guys are working on some hugely important projects that'll keep me safe while I'm flying back to Chicago. Yes. So I'd like to thank you for coming thank and you. talking to us. Okay, thank you for having us.